you very much for coming along to Biosphere, Climate Change and the Planet. Um, I'm Laura Rawlings and I present the afternoon show on BBC Radio Bristol and BBC Somerset. Um, when I was preparing for tonight and just thinking about climate change and poetry in general, I was thinking about how poetry and the natural world have for a long time been very connected to each other and it's given rise to some really great pieces of literature and I was thinking of things like um, Wordsworth's Daffodils, I wandered as lonely as a cloud. And I'm also thinking about others that show nature more in its rawest kind of form, thinking of someone like perhaps Ted Hughes and the bleak Yorkshire Moors. So poets have interpreted and celebrated the natural world for a long time. But I think that now we're moving into a slightly more critical phase where it's not just about celebrating poetry, but we're moving into a mode of actually wanting to protect nature. And I think this reflects the fact that global warming is now a matter of major public debate. And so the importance of writing in all of this has actually reached a new level. I don't know if you saw this in the paper just the other day, but in the Independent, this was something that was picked up. The um, chief scientist at the Met Office, she said that actually, if we're really going to tackle climate change, we need to have fewer, her words, turgid scientific reports with all the facts and kind of figures that can make you feel a bit disinterested or a bit disengaged or somehow not very empowered. And that actually, if we're really going to do something, scientists need to look towards the arts and in particular to poetry as a way of really creating a movement for change. So that's what we're about this evening. Um, so it's really good that the Arts Council has actually funded this, this evening of Biosphere as a pilot study of the themes. We've got a fantastic international panel with us this evening of poets, award-winning poets no less. Um, starting off, we've got Lorna Goodison, we've got David Briggs, we've got Claire Williamson, and we've got Nick McCohu. So please do give them a hearty welcome. Now, I just want to tell you about the format for this evening because it's really important because it's where you come in. So there is audience participation that's required for this. Our poets are going to take it in turns to perform a selection of their works, all on the theme of climate change. And then after that, we've got about 15 minutes for your questions. And they would really love to hear what your response is, what you would like to say to them, or any questions you might have. So if you can save them until the end. Um, if you really can't and you want to tweet about it, you can do. Just use the hashtag FON2014, which stands for Festival of Nature 2014. But um, really, they'd like to hear your questions. So without further ado, we're going to hear from our first poet for the night. It's the writer and performer Claire Williamson. Now Claire's actually based here in the West Country, um, but she's been on national tours. She's done all sorts of fantastic things. She's hosted lots of live events, collaborated on film poems, uh, and also opera-based projects. So if we're very lucky, perhaps she'll be singing for us tonight. I'm not sure. Um, but let's welcome Claire Williamson to do our first reading. Hello, lovely to see you all. Um, I did a lot of reading in order to do the writing for this evening. And um, it's very interesting because uh, what I found um, was that by reading lots of articles, I did become a little bit overwhelmed in reflection to what um, Laura's just been saying. And it was really useful then to find some forms to put it in. And so, one form that I chose was haiku, so a very short form, old Japanese short form of writing. So what I did was I read the article and then I, I distilled that down just to a few lines. Um, so I'm going to read those to start off with. <clears throat> and this method is also called, called uh, poetic transcription, and it was used with Holocaust survivor accounts where people couldn't take in all of what they've been saying. And, and there, I think there is an element, a slight element of trauma about reading lots and lots of accounts about climate change. Ha Antarctica melts. Cities, ecosystems drown as sea levels rise. Sundarban swamps flood. 
Bengal tigers' homes disappearing fast. Sumatran rhino feed on forest and peatland, blazing in dry heat. Global agreement will cut carbon emissions. Fact, not fiction. So the other form I took was a long form. <laughs> so uh, I've written a short story to reflect actually some of my experience of, of doing the reading, being a human being and reflecting on what I dread and trying to find some way of communicating that. It's called The Ripples. Monica looked at the state of the kitchen and started to tidy up. The children had gone to school, leaving cereal bowls and other debris on the table, and Monica knew from experience how quickly Weetabix become cement. If there's ever a mortar shortage, she mused, they'll know where to turn. Barney, the collie cross, was indulging in licking milk from the open dishwasher door. Stop that, Barney. Monica nudged him with her knees. She carried the empty yoghurt pots and last night's finished bottle of wine to the recycling bins in the garden. The bins seem to take up half the yard these days, the black box for paper and glass, the green bin for plastics, and the brown food waste bin. But she had to do her bit. Wasn't that an old phrase from World War I? Doing your bit? When she returned, Barney was back licking the dishwasher door like one of those oppressible space invaders of Monica's 1970s childhood. She closed the machine and threw Barney a biscuit. It was getting on for 8.30 now, and Monica had to go to work. She grabbed her plastic bottle of Evian from the side and her Tesco's low-calorie bean salad from the fridge, picked up her heavy work bag and headed for the car. See you at lunchtime, Barney. I'll take you for a quick run. It was another chilly May morning, and Monica was glad to be in the car. Even though she only worked a couple of miles down the road, she was always so rushed in the morning. She had to settle for the old Skoda. Her husband, Dan, always took the focus to work. He said he'd never be taken seriously rocking up in a Skoda. Monica had tentatively suggested getting a smart car once, and Dan had almost choked on his bagel. On the car radio, someone was talking about climate change. We have five times as much oil, coal and gas in stocks and shares as climate scientists think it is safe to burn. There should be a warning on petrol pumps in the same way that there is on cigarette packets. You know those pictures with people with a hole in their throats? Monica's mind started to wonder. She needed petrol, but it would last another day. She thought about being confronted with a photo on the petrol pump. What would it be? A polar bear clinging to a tiny island of ice, the flooded Somerset levels from the air. And how would she feel about it? Guilty. She knew that. She would never dream of smoking, especially at eight pounds for a packet of cigarettes. Who can afford that? There was a man standing outside a cafe smoking. The traffic was bad. Pedestrians were moving faster than she was. The programme on the radio continued. Yes, this coal and gas and oil is still technically in the soil, but it's already economically above ground. Companies are borrowing money against it. Nations are basing their budgets on the presumed returns from their patrimony. It explains why the big fossil fuel companies have fought so hard to prevent the regulation of carbon dioxide. Those reserves are their primary asset, the holding that gives their companies their value. The problem with climate change is that it doesn't feel real, thought Monica, as a radio program was silenced by her turning off the car engine. She picked up her lunch bag and her bag from the passenger seat and walked into the shabby office building under the innocuous insurance company sign. She'd worked there part-time for five years now. The heating was on as usual. You could write your name in the condensation on the windows. She opened the one by her desk a crack to let in some fresh air. Hi, Monica said Gabrielle, Monica's colleague, who was wearing a brightly patched felt cardigan. Thank God it's Friday, eh? Yes, said Monica, though I'm not sure what's worse, three days here or four days with the kids. What are you up to this weekend? Gabrielle leaned her elbows on the desk and twiddled her nose ring. We're off to the Natural History Museum to see the Wildlife Photographer of the Year exhibition with the boys. Going on the train? The train? We're not made of money. No, we're going on Sunday when there's no congestion charge. There's a sneaky place I know where we can park and walk from there. Monica looked at the avalanche of papers on her desk. Gabrielle's bangles jangled. 
You know, I've always felt uneasy about that photography exhibition. Photos of animals and landscapes under a great big P BP sign. Monica looked up. I know what you mean, but it's changed now to a waste management company. I looked it up because I had no idea who Veolia were. I didn't know it changed, said Gabriel. Yes, it has, but browsing the website, I noticed BP still do sponsor the museum, along with Rio Tinto, Starbucks, lots of big banks, insurance companies, credit card companies. What can you do? They've all got a hand in each other's pockets, the government, these corporations. Gabriel was drawing a sad face on the condensation on the window. We should all be doing more. Get this place properly insulated for a start. Water dribbled down the image to make it look like it was crying. Monica plonked her lunch on the desk with a thump. Gabriel turned. How's the diet going, by the way? Badly, said Monica. I was doing well until I slipped up on some chocolate bourbons last night. But I'm taking Barney for a jog at lunchtime, so I hope that that will help to offset it a bit. What, offset your bourbon footprint? Something like that. You could jog to work, said Gabriel, instead of taking the car. Save some money on fuel. You're right, but I haul this bag around every day. Monica pointed to her leather satchel, bringing the files and papers. Surely you don't need all that. Just bring the papers you need for the day in a rucksack. I could, said Monica, but it's bad enough sorting out what the kids need for school every day. The sports kit, wellies for forest school. Forest school? Shrieked Gabriel. That's a laugh. They have to take kids to a forest these days, because otherwise they won't know what one looks like. We might be hanging out in a forest before we know it, building dens to live in and fighting over water supplies, said Monica. Who knows, said Gabriel. I don't know if they're scaremongering us or what about all this climate change stuff. No one seems to be doing much about it. I mean, you've got two cars because you can afford it and nobody's stopping you. But if you had to, you could manage with one or none, if the buses were any good. I know, Gabriel, but who's going to break the bad news to the businesses? Gabriel jangled again. We need big change, not little change. Someone's plucked up the courage to stop people smoking in pubs. Why not put more pressure on us? I don't know, to, to stop buying packaged foods and bottled water. She nodded towards Monica's lunch. Hey, that's my treat for coming to work. What, because you're worth it? Tell that to your kids when they're living in a shack in the woods trying to catch a passing squirrel for breakfast. Very funny, Gabriel, but I've got some work to do today. Monica tapped away at her computer all morning, entering the figures for the last week into the spreadsheet. Emails flooded in thick and fast about all sorts of things. A sponsored cycle ride across China for Macmillan that a colleague was doing. More returns for the spreadsheet. There was a card that needed to be signed for Jill, whose grandson had been killed in Afghanistan. Monica felt uneasy, as if all these things were somehow connected. Climate change, cancer, population booms, the wars firing up all over the world and no one doing anything about it. She just couldn't get her head round it all. She plodded on with the figures and tucked into her bean salad at the same time, dropping blobs of dressing on her mouse mat. Gabriel was trying to persuade the communal printer to give up some paper that it clenched in its internal jaws. Damn it! When are they going to update this useless equipment? <clears throat> Monica couldn't help taking small pleasure in Gabriel's frustration and glance at her watch. It was noon already. I'm going to lunch, Gabs. See you in an hour. Have a good jog, lovely. Get those calories running for the hills. Hopefully this will be working by the time you get back. Monica was never sure if Gabriel was being sarcastic or supportive. She decided it was the latter. She couldn't bear the thought of the former, working with that disingenuousness day in, day out. She didn't have time to be worried about politics. Sitting in the car, Monica was listening to the news again. A few more soldier and civilian deaths in Afghanistan. Obesity figures. Some American senator was talking. I don't agree with the notion that some people are putting out there, including scientists, that somehow there are actions we can take today that would actually have an impact on what's happening in our climate. Now I know that's not true, said Monica out loud, turning into her road. Something came back to her that she hadn't thought about for years. She studied social anthropology as one of her economics modules at university. The word was bioculture. She had no idea what the term meant at the time. She thought it was just a bunch of hippies wanting everyone to have an allotment. But it's more about thinking about the way the Earth's affected by the human, and that we can make changes in our culture before evolution makes a change to our genes. That's the wonder of being a community. We can change things before it's too late. Unlike Darwin's straight-beat finches, who never saw their demise coming, we can have an impact on our environment in reverse, we can club together to do this in the way that we can raise sponsorship for a cycle trip to China. 
As she opened her front door, Barney was pushing his nose through the gap, keen to go out. Quickly, Monica pulled on her running kit and trainers and took Barney through the back lane to the meadow and the lake. Barney was on the lead, but happily running by her side. Monica always had such gratitude for him, the way he was at her mercy. Was it right to domesticate animals? Another big question she hadn't got her head around. Maybe pulling Barney about on a lead was as bad as pulling down the rainforest and forcing orangutans out of their natural habitat. None of these animals had a choice. The day had warmed up, and for the first time that year, there was a sense that summer might actually come. Monica let Barney off the lead, and they both stopped running. He was sniffing about at the edge of the lake. The image of the polar bear on a piece of ice kept coming back into Monica's mind. Would people at the petrol pump know the significance of it? She did. She'd seen a programme about how the ice was around for less time each year, making it difficult for the females to hunt for food, and the bears were fasting longer, meaning they were weaker. Monica thought, it's hard enough being a parent when I can go to Sainsbury's any time I like. She wondered how she would explain to the children that the last polar bear had just died. Everything we do has consequences, thought Monica. <clears throat> I buy bottled water from the supermarket. Small businesses die. Big businesses have more power to dry suppliers harder, straining the land, the farmers, the animals to breaking point. And then there's the plastic bottles creating CO2 in their making and their slow demise. I wouldn't force my kids to smoke cigarette knowing it was killing them, so why force feed plastic to the earth? Monica became aware of how lush the grass looked, how the willow with its slender leaves whispered seductively in the breeze. A thrill of the beauty of it all shivered through her. Bees buzzed at the wild flowers on the edge of the lake. Bees, they're significant too, thought Monica, all the pollination that we take for granted. She felt overwhelmed and was pleased to be distracted by Barney, who was snuffling at the edge of the lake and getting excited. He'd found something. Monica moved towards him to investigate. It was a toad. Move back, Barney. Monica bent down and picked up the toad and looked at it carefully. She hadn't done anything like this since she was a kid. The toad was heavy in her hand, like a lump of dough. Its yellow and brown speckled throat pumped anxiously. It looked serious, dignified in its toadiness. It blinked and jumped into the water with a celebratory splash. Ripples moved out from where it disappeared. Every choice I make has ripples and consequences, said Monica out loud to Barney. She stood still, taking in the ripples and feeling transported back to her youth. The hours of staring into ponds and country walks with Grandad, sharing thick farm ham sandwiches wrapped in greaseproof paper, going to the graveyard to sort out Grandma's headstone, how nature was always trying to grow over it, recover, colonise, renew. She wanted to offer this sense of abundance and freedom to her children and grandchildren that she'd enjoyed. She felt a tear escape down her cheek. I don't know what to do, Barney. I feel so helpless. Barney came over concerned and looked up at Monica with his big brown eyes and unconditional love. Monica stroked his soft furry ears, warm by the sunshine. She wiped the tears away. Maybe I know more than I think, Barney boy, said Monica, clipping on the lead. Let's go home. Monica jogged back to the house with a renewed sense of energy. She didn't change out of her runner gear, but stuffed her work clothes into her son's old Superman rucksack, thinking she didn't care if she looked ridiculous. She refilled her Evian bottle with tap water, threw Barney a biscuit again, and set off down the road to work. It felt good to be in the world. She could hear conversations from people in the local shops as she jogged past. She felt part of the things that she hadn't felt for a long time. She'd become a machine, churning out work, processing children to school, through baths, into bed, all to start over again the next day. Gabrielle seemed pleased to see Monica in her running gear. You didn't take the car, she smiled. And I was thinking, said Monica, that if I don't buy bottled water for a year, we can afford to take the train to London. It would be more fun for the kids than being stuck in the car. Nice rucksack, said Gabriel, laughing. Thanks, said Monica. She went to the cloakroom and locked the door. She switched on the shower tap. No one ever used the shower at work that was put in for people who might cycle. She was a pioneer. She watched the clean, fresh water splashing into the tray. I'm going to make positive ripples, she thought, and teach my kids the same. She remembered the toad, the walks with Grandad, the sound of the busy bees and the wildflowers by the lake, and she felt an immense sense of gratitude, pleasure, power, 
and hope. Thank you very much, Claire. It, I don't know what it is, but there really is something about just the act of sitting, listening, something that's a story that goes on for, you know, sort of 10 minutes or so. And I don't know whether you felt this, but I certainly did. There were lots of things that you picked up there in terms of that shared experience, those dilemmas that we all have, the feeling that you go to the office and you can't change anything. Um, the contradictions, whether you take a train or a car, all of that, as well as picking up on some of the other drivers of global change as well, thinking about globalisation. So it's not just climate change, but we're looking at other things too. Um, ultimately, though, the fact is there are lots of small things, and I guess if we all did them collectively, it would make a big difference. So thank you, Claire, for kicking us off. Um, moving on now to our second poet of the evening. I looked up his Twitter profile, because that's often quite an interesting way, just to see how people like to describe themselves. A pithy summary. Um, Nick's smiling now, but he's put that he's a poet, a playwright, a Ugandan Jedi based in London, <laughs> which I think is quite an intriguing tease. Um, Nick is the director of the Youth Poetry Network. He's a widely published poet. Um, he has lived in Uganda and he fled the country with his mother during the Idi Amin dictatorship and they moved to Kenya, to Saudi Arabia and the UK, which I think adds particular poignancy and a perspective when we're talking about something that's a global issue. So um, let's welcome Nick Makoha to the stage as our second poet. Okay, I'm a bit nervous. Some of you I remember from last year, so I'm seeing some faces in the crowd and I'm like, I know you, but I, I'm not gonna approach you because I'm just too scared it might just be my memory. So, uh, but hello anyway. I'm gonna read you um, a poem I've written particularly for um, the climate change. And I was thinking of the word climate change and uh, it's kind of like Ron Seal. It does exactly what it says on the tin. And a lot of times when people think about climate change, they just think about the weather but it's, the it's what's caused the change in the weather that you've got to think about. So I've kind of taken um, a step back and um, a lot of things that cause the climate that we have are the way that we treat the world and, or you know, more specifically, the way that we treat each other. So um, I just did a haiku, as soon as you did a haiku, I just made one up, I don't know if it works, but it goes like this. You can have it all, copper, diamonds, oil, at the cost of life. Yeah? And that's pretty much what I'm looking at with this poem that I wrote. I hope it works out. You tell me if it doesn't. You can tell me. I'll, I'll still be a friend. Yeah? So, uh, so it's called The Last Days. To the already dead, to those dying in their sleep, to those flooded by a wet season that did not wait for, the last, year, for last year's crop, to the weeping wounded, to those hiding in the fever of a night waist deep in mud, to those standing in line for the body of Christ, to the smoke, the only thing that rises without interrogation, to the thirst, left in the mouths of men, quenched by the glass of a woman, the glass of another country, the glass that is not a glass, but a truck filled with the bodies with bodies hemmed together by wire, a truck that yesterday was filled with the toxic barrels and before that, money, and before that, guns. Money that you will never see and will never spend by men who tell you the price of oil in your car. Oil from countries that are not their own, who, who take parts, who turn parts of the world to deserts and war zones. In the name of democracy, or in its real name, victory. To the empty spaces that exist, when a man's words become familiar ghosts. To those who spoke of rebellion, and now with the moon on their back, and the, their bodies are now maggots in a ditch. To the palm of the immortals, that can raise a river from the bed and have it stare at a man in the eye. To the never-ending silence, 
that knows us before we were human, to those who thirst and hold their hands like brackets, waiting for the thunder, searching for the shape of the body when it makes the sign of prayer. So this poem is called Synthesis. Oh yeah, I, I, I've got to tell you this one, yeah, check this out, right? So I've got a theory. It's my theory, it's a stupid theory. But I, I, want, to, I want to turn it into a, like, a, like a program. Right, you ready? You guys aren't talking, man. Are you ready? Yes. All right, good, all right, good. I thought you are dead. It's too hard, Nick, I can't talk. <laughs> uh, climate change, anyway. So it's called uh, the black bag theory. So part of... Um, you know, all the time they talk about climate change, a lot of times I, I suddenly realized uh, when I was about maybe five, maybe 10 years ago, because I've had a kid for, for nine, so it must be yeah, 10 years ago. It's called the black bag theory, yeah? So basically, if you go around your house and take away the things that you don't need or you don't use regularly, you'll actually find there's a lot of waste in your house. So that waste that you're worrying about, I want to change the planet. The planet exists in your house, and I call it the black bag theory. So I go through my stuff, so you, you might find like, you've got 20, well, I don't know, I don't have that many jeans, but you have 10 pairs of jeans and you only wear three. You got 50 pairs of shoes and you only wear five. You see how that goes? Now that, that indulgence, that need, is, is, that, is, is part of the problem of climate change. So it's a change in temperament. So here's a short poem, it's called Synthesis, and then I'll go into more poems of this nature. So it's called Synthesis. Cold mud in your hand, gathered from a city that you live in, Needed like cassava in your palm. Add white light from the sky and cold dust from beneath the soil. And then uh, the next poem I want to read you is called The Dark. And the, the kind of thinking between that, and I'm trying to connect the poems in, in, a, in a sensibility. So, um, a lot of parts of the world, people. Um, they have despair. So a lot of times, uh, particularly in this, in this, what we call the Western world, our despairs are things like, ah, oh, just missed my favorite show. Whereas somebody else is like, ah, oh, I can't eat. Or I've lost a person that I love. So a lot of times the things that matter to us, so a lot of times why, the, why climate change can't be addressed is because our concerns are not the concerns that, that galvanize humankind. You know, and we've been trained that way. So, um, and that's just something to, so this poem kind of, it slightly touches on it, but I'm, I hope you can understand what I was trying to get at. So it's called The Dark. You will try to make sense of it, of the terrain, its limits on reality, its secondary sounds, the cricket speaking in pure rhetoric. What is the year? No matter. Stripped of remembrance, isn't the dark a grave? An axis by which all are measured, the final mounted. Blessed are the dead, whose bodies are buried in the bosom of the earth. Blessed are those who no longer taste the fury, when brought to silence make their dust their paper. In these hours of damp, the sky will witness bombs hollow out a city. Be vigilant, choose your execution as well. Do not talk of wills, bless the pavements, that will become your burial grounds. For what can we give but accept our bodies? Those who were your children will make homes in doorways. Cover your heads. Our patriarchs have, ripped off, have been ripped off the walls. It is not the dark, but what it leaves behind. A servant girl on her knees gives testimony that the king has been added to our days dead. Lose respect, lose ceremony, lose duty, lose circumstantial evidence, lose the code. My father should not have died today. Lose the law, lose remembering, lose absence. In the absence of the law, truth will not be written down. Lose those who break it. Cowards who confess on starchy, ra scratchy radio broadcasts, Field generals and their informers lose epitaphs, 
I have my father's eyes and ratchet smile. Mirrors betray me. What anchors me has drifted to the boundary. What's a poor murder? He should not have died at war. Close combat, an instep to the shoulder, a knee to the chest, or his, or his crown caught in the eye of a symbol rebel scope as the world draws close, not caught off guard in a drunkard brawl over his wife. This is how the loss of light should come to the world. How much time do I have? How much time do I have? You've got um, seven minutes. Genius, look at that. You need one of those, man. That's better than a Tom Top. <laughs> and we were talking about that. Oh yeah, by the way, I have to say this, right? I like, I like Bristol for two reasons. I like that guy at the back there, Asif. <laughs> if he's your friend, it's probably gonna go right. <laughs> and I get to see Lorna Goodison again, which probably means we're gonna have a good conversation at, at dinner, not lunch, lunch is gone, yeah? <laughs> so uh, let me read you a few more poems. Um, and what I'm interested in, you don't have to tell me, you can just tell the person you came with or the person you go home to or the person you go to work to see tomorrow. Just, I, I'm always interested in when somebody's reading a poem, what are the thoughts that came up in your mind? Do you know what I mean? Ah, oh, you got thoughts there, you see? You to talk to him about it, all right? So just what thoughts came up in your mind? So a lot of times, a lot of times why things happen in the world with um, climate change, I realize it's all on broken promises. So there are parts of the world, people are always promising things. We live in a country right now where they promised us a certain education, they promised us they wouldn't raise things. And if you look around the world, um, this is the word that's been coming to me. I realize that in, I, I just, I, I come from Uganda and you, can, you know what a dictator is. Oh, he's, take, you know, he's taken over the country, he's taken all the money. But if you look, a lot of things that dictators do in third world countries, they do exactly the same here. But we don't call them dictators, we call them like prime ministers or, but they're doing exactly the same thing. You know, so they're taking this exactly the same amount of money, they have the same luxuries at the cost of everyone else, but in the, in the third world, you call that guy a dictator and he should be shut down. In the first world, you say to him, I'm not voting for that party. It's just something I've noticed, and that's what this kind of poem brings to mind. I know it's radical, don't get me shot, but I said it. All right, so here you go. Big Nation. He promises, us, he promises us that there will be much to eat. After the shootings, that he will order the finest. We bow as is customary for elders in our village. Faces turned, eyes closed, but some don't buy the talk. But the sky is smoking at the edge of the town where the plane fell. Soldiers return, blood bathed, as a crowd builds. They speak in clicks. My empty stomach growls. I have drifted off to some far off sound. Big names gather. Some have camped on the path, middle-aged folk, children born with phantom limbs. A shaman with a painted tooth squatting over burnt ash. A girl playing hopscotch with a child slumped over her shoulder. The albino dogs look up at me. I kneel, his tail wags, mosquitoes off my shins. And when the elder asks, I tell him, this man is a firm knot in our chest, a landlord draped in Savile Row suits, who uses our town as a, ra as a racetrack. Mark the length of his shadow. Where it reaches, men fall. What can, you, what can he buy with food that was not ours already? What god is he? No moon and star fear him. He is not even of our blood. We were a legion before the Imperials, before our nation changed hands, before the world called it nation. What wind is he that I must kneel like a man in prayer? Why must I whisper? He is not even my flag. All right, just uh, read. Um, so the other thing is, which is uh, what we're hearing nowadays, is so you can you turn on the news, click. At some point, they will, you will get to the weather, but before you get to the weather, they'll tell you that somewhere in the world, somebody has killed somebody else, 
or somebody has taken somebody else's land. And basically that's what it's, so all this change is, is basically creating a fear in men and women. And it's that fear that is, is, is galvanizing any goodwill that can be driven into any effort like say climate change. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this poem. It's called The Bee. And um, I hope you like it. I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the evening. So uh, then I'm going to eat because I'm hungry. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So here you go. The bee. When the sun abandoned me, the sky was an iris of black glass. Nights kept me sleepless. The trick was to unblink the eyes till morning, whether opened or closed. Butterflies in the tall grass taught me to cling to the world's back. As my mind swung in on itself, I could hear the river stretch towards the stones. The thought of death set fire to dreams. In this shapeless dark, I pierced enough together to see the trees ghosting themselves. They stood around a dead man who had been stung by the invisible bee of my bullet. This edge of the world was close to the border. Like lightning behind a bank of clouds, I hid from the scene that had played itself to a conclusion. You know, it could have been worse. He could have shot me. Thank you very much, Nick. Well, let's, um, let's just do the black bag theory right now, shall we? <laughs> uh, who could go round and do that in their house this weekend? Come on. You've done it all right. Well, brilliant. Well, brownie points to you. That's it. <laughs> OK, so the lady over there has already led the way. So that's um, the challenge for this weekend, in and amongst going to the poetry yurts and dropping in and listening to more free poetry. Uh, you've got to get a black bin liner out and, and do your bit. Um, also, Nick, you, you said about what's going through your head when you're listening to poetry. And um, I'm sure I echo other people in the room when I say this, but when you were saying doing the poem that came right after that and you were talking about what's left and you said... Um, I have my father's eyes. I felt that bit was incredibly um, moving and, and what a moment. So thank you. But we look forward to hearing what you were thinking. Don't forget um, at the end. Right, moving on to our next poet of the night. We've got David Briggs. Now he's a published poet who in his spare time um, manages to fit in being head of English at a school in Bristol. Um, I was reading some of David's poems before this evening and I'll just share a couple that I really liked. He's done one about the ghosts of Highgate Cemetery. It's a really atmospheric piece and also one about Snow, which um, I wonder if we'll hear it tonight. It's a great piece and would fit in. But let's welcome to the stage David Briggs. Good evening. Uh, I don't want there to be too many surprises, so I'm going to tell you that I'll end my set by reading the poem that I've written for this festival on climate change. But I'm going to start by reading a few poems from uh, my first two books. And for me, one of the most interesting aspects of this commission has been to re-examine my own relationship with nature and with the natural world in the light of climate change, and then to look at my work again through that lens. So I've tried to select poems which I think are still interesting when, when looked at through that very specific lens. And I want to read a poem about bees, because as Nick's just demonstrated, it is obligatory for every poet to have a poem about bees. Not least because so many aspects of bee behaviour are a perfect metaphor for many aspects of human behaviour, um, but also because we're completely reliant on them. If we lose our pollinating insects, then famine and chaos will very quickly ensue. This poem about bees has an epigraph uh, from a piece of Roman tort law to do with the ownership of bees. A swarm without a hive has no master which refers to the fact that once bees go into hive, they don't belong to anyone. They belong to whomsoever it is that can entice them to settle down in a new hive. This is called In the Senior Common Room. The divinity master kept bees, his apiary set beyond 
the second eleven's outfield at the gorse-hedged limit of the grounds. Long summer afternoons they watched him, going among hives, through wedged shadows, and those who couldn't hold a bat straight opted off games to go to the honeybee and learn how diligent she is. The breaking of the comb honey's wax capping was what they came to cherish, an Arcadian creme brulee they smeared on hot crumpets, spooned into tea those autumn nights in the oak-panelled study. He told them, bees were blessed when leaving Eden, became handmaids of the Most High, how Bretons believed them the tears of Christ crucified, how they sing Hosanna in excelsis on the stroke of midnight each Christmas Eve, for which he would bless them with slabs of fondant. They wore the angry blotches on their knuckles proudly, and when a swarm of errant drones drunk on gorse flowers flew a careless scrawl through the lunch hall window to rummage among the treacle puddings and prompt H.M., worn beyond patience by years of bee-related complaint to pronounce. Since you cannot control them, these pests are no more welcome here than disease. They replied, but how do you know they're our bees? <laughs> I'm going to read one more poem from this book, which, like that one, um, is an example of me, like a good capitalist, ruthlessly mining the natural world uh, in order to extract every last seam of meaning that I can. Um, this one is called Snow. It's also obligatory for poets to have a poem called Snow um, as a metaphor for many things. Louis McNeese's poem called Snow is famously a metaphor for the blank page, the, the intimidating blank page, the unfertile blank page. This poem called Snow also has an epigraph. Um, it's from Stephen Pinker's book, The Language Instinct. Uh, where he explodes the popular myth that the Inuit have hundreds of words for snow. Uh, they don't. Counting generously, Pinker writes, experts can come up with about a dozen. But I think part of the popularity of that myth is that um, the idea that a culture living in very close uh, proximity to a very particular natural phenomenon would, over a period of time and close observation, identify you know, a huge range of fine gradations within that particular natural phenomenon, and therefore a huge lexicon with which to articulate all those fine shades of difference. Unfortunately, it's not true. Or at least it's, <laughs> it's not true when it comes to Inuits and snow. Snow. Say there are no words for lawyer in the Inuit tongue, yet perhaps a dozen by which to adjudicate snowfall. Say there is no English word for the particular spectacle of aurora-lit snowfall. While for lawyer, we have barrister, attorney, brief, solicitor, silk, advocate, justice, litigator, magistrate, counsel, prosecutor, perhaps even jurisprudentia. And it follows that in the land where they speak only statistics, there will be a sworn affidavit against each irregular snowflake. But you are advised not to impugn the government of such climes for burying truth beneath an icy deluge of little whitely lying words. Some thoughts will simply fail to settle in our language or gather only in obscure mountainous regions. This thought itself may fail to find the climate necessary to its survival, and so melt gently on the thick muscle of my tongue, as might tla, snow, tla slow, slow falling snow, or pensla, Merely the idea of snow. Uh, I'd like to read just a few poems from my second book, which is called Rain Rider. I'd like to read the title poem. 
Uh, there's an epigraph, again, I'm obsessed with epigraphs. There's an epigraph to the book as a whole, which is uh, a sentence from an essay by Ezra Pound. Some poems may have form as a tree has form, some as water poured into a vase. For me, I understand that to, to refer to the fact that often the, the act of writing a poem is akin to uh, the way a tree grows. You know, it happens slowly and gradually, and the poem finds the shape it wants to grow into tentatively over time. Every now and again, the act of writing a poem can be like pouring the contents of your mind into a conveniently placed and appropriately shaped receptacle. Not very often, but sometimes. So this poem is kind of about ideas and inspiration, but the, the impetus for it um, was a couple of summer, summers ago in France. One of those very, very strangely localised and very intense rainstorms, not quite a single cloud trailing a, a skein of rain, but not far off. Rain Rider. We heard the rain before it reached us. From across two fields, a drum roll on snares across furrowed counterscarps coming at pace. There must have been a full minute between this tattoo and its arrival at our flagstones, where it reared as a jump-shy horse. I swear, a billion raindrops coalesced as the vision of a gun-smoke grey stallion paddling its forehooves in air, straining to buck its rider, one hand on the reins, a chalice in the other, into which it poured the miracle of itself as a retiring genie, fizzed at the brim like lithium. You reached out, grabbed the cup, drained to its lees the whole storm. I spend the days with my head on your lap, counting each kick of the rain. A lot of poems in this book uh, take their starting points from characters in the tarot. And this one is called The Hermit, which is one of the 22 trump cards in the tarot, uh, one of the major arcana, and also the favorite tarot card of Led Zeppelin guitarist Jimmy Page. It doesn't have anything to do with the poem, but it's an interesting detail. Uh, and I chose to read this poem because for me it represents a very uh, moment of great intimacy between a human being and nature, the natural world, um, but also uh, with, with a shadow of something a bit more menacing hanging over it at the end. The Hermit. A swallow's deft dart and dip under the hermitage eaves, circling the barky space, a thread-swung bobbin to the wattle-spit nest high among rafters red-throated warbler, song, an ungreased cartwheel, finishing notes, a gust-bothered tarp. The hermit, oblivious, his mind, a cloud-creamed lake into which he has fallen, finds he can breathe water, lost in the depths, pushing by polyp and bladderack with the butt of his staff. Pearl diving the psyche, eyes bright as Davy lamps in a coal seam. Harmonious co inhabitants, neither aware of the other, or of the developer's pen in the oak panelled office of a foothill town, the deft dart and dip of his signature. One more poem from this book, and uh, this is called Pen Lee, um, and it's dedicated to the lifeboat men of the Pen Lee lifeboat station, very close to the small Cornish harbour town of Mausel, just outside. It's not a lifeboat station anymore, it's a memorial. Um, but about 20 or so years ago, um, they had terrible storms down in Cornwall, very like the storms we had just this winter. And 50-foot uh, waves were recorded, and a tanker with a very small crew got into trouble just about a mile or so off the coast of Mausel, dead of winter, uh, the dead of night. And these men, you know, they, they got out of bed. They, they heard the call, 
and they went down to the station, they got in the boat, they went out into these waves, and um, even though it was impossible to, to, to rescue the crew, they refused to abandon them, and everyone perished. This is called Penley. One corpse only was found intact. Hearing that the others were broken to bits between 50-foot waves and granite outcrops, ground like mussel shell, shocks the spirit. Lightning flash of a reality obscured by commonplace phrases like died at sea, chiseled in headstones. Those who live on jagged coastlines, who've beachcombed and rock pooled for limbs, heads, torsos of mates, brothers, fathers, know what's behind the epitaph, know it not as recognition, as understanding, but as something absorbed, fact that's moved through mind and sinew, colouring each irrevocably. So, when the lights go off for an hour in remembrance and the ship grows hushed, it's a different ocean out there, beyond the walls, for each of us. Each of us, despite your man's assurance, an island entire unto ourselves. Our bottle-stoppered messages at the mercy or indifference of whichever sea surrounds us. I'll end with the poem I've written for the festival, and this poem takes its cue from Pastor Martin Niemuller, who was the anti-Nazi German theologian who wrote in opposition to Hitler a very famous piece, which you, you probably have heard. It begins, first they came for the Jews, and I did nothing because I wasn't a Jew, and then they came for the communists, and I did nothing because I wasn't a communist. And, and so it goes on until at the very end, they, they come for him, and there's no one left to do anything. So I've basically stolen that idea and then uh, reapplied it to the context of climate change. First they came. First, the rains came hard as heart attacks. Tributaries rivers swollen, floodplains at sea for months. And I did nothing because I did not live on a floodplain, but I saw the refugees on television cradling confused dogs in dinghies, paddling for higher ground, leaving behind them homes haunted by ghost flotillas of tins and saucepans adrift on a brown tide in flooded kitchens. Then, the hurricanes came so fast, they unspun meaning from their names. And we had to coin new words for storms that uprooted whole towns from their east coast zip codes, like so many potato drills. And I did nothing because I did not live on America's eastern seaboard, but I marveled at YouTube shorts of houses imploding like punctured lungs. When drought came to the Mediterranean, it came so often that farmers walked away from their fields, were found hanging from rafters in barns even the rats had abandoned, or were swept into shanties like Sirocco blown dust into the pith craters of tangerines. And I did nothing because I did not live in southern Italy, but I cursed the distended price of olives and Chianti. Rainforest became savanna. I carved my imported ribeye. Water stress headached through Africa. I hosed down my Range Rover. But when the great ice sheets carved, and the seas rose like loaves. Those sundry states of emergency, the skyrocketing price of land, the peoples in diaspora, the conflict and the chaos, the everyone for himself. I did nothing because it was too late. 
They are coming for me in a frigate strewn with human bones, hoving into view from my penthouse balcony. And there is no one left to object. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Well, who'd have thought that Roman tort law was going to be a part of this and uh, an Arcadian creme brulee? Um, <laughs> Thank you. I really love the observations in Snow. I think that poem is so clever. And also the image of the horse as well in the one where you're talking about rain. And I think the one that you finished with, um, first they came, that does more than prick your conscience. So thank you, David. Um, last but by no means least, we've got Lorna Goodison with us. Now, Lorna was born in Jamaica. Um, she is one of the most distinguished writers of her generation. I'm guessing she's had her mantelpiece extended to hold lots of her awards. Um, she also shares what she does and what she knows as well, because she's a professor, and she's patron of the Yardstick Festival of Black Writers in Bristol and Bath. Now, I just want to share a quick story with you. I actually had the pleasure of interviewing Lorna about this time last year, and um, in one of those moments, just before we were going live on the radio, we got talking about meeting Nelson and Winnie Mandela some time ago, and how Lorna had actually penned a poem for Winnie called Bedspread, and I just randomly said as I do in these scenarios oh do you reckon you can remember anything and tell us and she very calmly just picked up a pen there wasn't any paper because times are hard so she found a, a, um, a brown paper bag and she just quickly wrote the entire poem from like 20 years previously you can see that I've still got it here <laughs> And then she recited it live on the radio, literally moments later. And to this day, it makes me smile when I think of it. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to welcome our final poet to the stage tonight, Lorna Goodison. I shall light a candle of understanding in thine heart, which shall not be put out. I shall light. First, debts to pay and then fences to mend. Later, rest the past to foes disguised as friends. I shall light a candle of understanding in thine heart. All things in their place then, in the many chambered heart. For each thing a place and for him a place apart. I shall light a candle of understanding in thine heart, which shall not be put out. And by the hand that lit the candle, by the never to be extinguished flame, by the candle wax which wind worry drips into candle wings, luminous and rare. By the illumination of that candle exit death and fear and doubt. Hear love and the possibility within a lit heart shining out. Good evening, thank you very much for being here. And thank you very much, Asif, for inviting me. And I love Bristol, it's my third time. I mean. <laughs> I'll just jump right in and read a poem called Change if you must, but change slow. This is my poem of address to the universe, to the world. It started off as driving through the countryside in Jamaica and thinking if climate change, when, when, if and when it does come, all of this will change. So as a poet, all I have are my words, and I'm just asking if it has to change, if it could just slow down and change slow. Change if you must, but change slow. We will crouch down then in a red earth hollow, press our lips close to the heart of this deep cockpit country and call out, please don't change, or change if you must, just change slow. Old countryman riding the jackass, big woman watering the dry peas, fat cow, marga dog, one room dwelling with intricate carved lace fretwork eaves. Heaped yam hills, garlands of green vines, cockades of bamboo on the crown of the hillside. Little bit of country village or woodland, name of content, wire fence, stetting, all sides. Far from the main of gunman and town strife, country we leave from to go and make life. I'm going to read uh, an elegy for my mother. It's called After the Green Gown of My Mother Gone Down. And um, 
in the poem, I ret we're returning my mother to the earth. And all I can hope is that because she was such a good caretaker here on earth, that she's doing some work like that to help the earth because she's gone back to it. I've always felt that people on islands would return to the water. So I've returned her to the earth and returned her to the water in the hope that she'll make strong intervention for us on behalf of slowing down the change. After the green gown of my mother gone down, August, her large heart slowed down and then stops. Fall now and trees flame, catch a fire and riot. Last leaves in scarlet and gold fever burning. Remember when you heard Bob Marley hymn redemption song? And from his tone and timbre, you sensed him traveling. He had sent the band home and was just keeping himself company, a cooling star. Sad rude boy fretting on a cowboy box guitar in a studio with stray echo and wailing sound. Lost singing scatting through the door of no return. And when the green goes, beloved, the secret is opened. The breath will fall still and the life covenant broken. Dress my mother's cold body in a deep green gown. Catch a fire and let fall and flame time come after the green gown of my mother gone down. We laid her down full of days, chant Grio from the Book of Life and summon our kin from the long-lived line of David and Margaret. Come clear thine Alberta, Flavius, Edmund, Howard and Rose, Marcus our husband gone before, come and walk their Doris home. And the Blue Mountains will open to her to seal her corporeal self in. From the ancient vault, which is your lapis lazuli heart, the headwaters of all our rivers spring. Headwaters wash away the embalmer's myrrh resin, the dredging of white powder caking her cold limbs. Return her ripe body clean to fallow the earth. For her eyes to become brown agate stones, from her forehead may they dawn bright mornings. May her white hair contribute to the massing of clouds, cause the blood settled in her palms to sink into fish-filled lagoons. Earth, she was a mother like you who birthed and nursed her children. Look, cherubims and angels, see her name written down in the index of the faithful in the Mother of Pearl Book of Saints. Mama, Aunt Anne says she saw Aunt Rose come out of an orchard red with ripe fruit and call out laughing to you and that you scaled the walls like two young girls and scampered barefoot among the lush fruit groves. My mother's sea shanty. I dream that I am washing my mother's body in the night sea and that she sings slow and that she still breathes. I see my sweet mother, a plump mermaid in my dreams, and I wash her white hair with ambergris and foaming seaweed. I watch my mother underwater, gather the loose pearls she finds, scrub them free from knacker, and string them on a lost fishing line. I hear my dark mother speaking sea speak with pilot fish, showing them how to direct barks that will bear away our anguish. And I pray my mother breaks free from her fish pots and marine chores of our residence beneath the sea, and that she rides a wild white horse. Mm. It's a poem I wrote last time I was here. I went down to the Lake District, and I was t talking to Nick, my friend here, Nick, and saying that people in Africa and the Caribbean need to find out what you, the British, do to keep the Lake District looking as pristine as it looks. <laughs> I mean, the skiddaws look like somebody combs and brushes them every night. <laughs> and so, anyway, you remember that, Nick? Yeah, yeah. So this poem is called Across the Fields to St. Beggars. We went to St. Beggars Church. You know that St. Beggars Church by Bassentwaite? No? Okay. <laughs> Clear the style set in the low stone wall, then set out across to where St. Beggar beckons. Do step, step soft past drowsing dams who suckle newborns beneath shade trees 
and you have never seen so many lambs fattening on creamy ewe milk. Sweet face they are, these ideal baby sheep. All soot cheeks and shine eyes, head set to side. Plump bodies upholstered tight with wool stuff. Same as rolled wide thatch capping pates of elders. Gate latch does not yield, jump fence again, and land on stone tombs. Tennyson passed through here, Wordsworth too. But St. Vegas at noon is silent, except for wisps of matins candle smoke, and leaflets which tell of our miraculous bracelet. Beggar's, ring, beggar's wristband, ring fence against harm, ring us round with blessings. Once again into the fields to sight the psalm, sheep lying down by green pastures in ba by Basentwaite still waters. So as beautiful as that looked, I'm now going to tell you about going back to where my mother was born. My mother and her people come from a place called Harvey River, and I've written about this extensively. And uh, the river gave its name to the village, and my mother grew up in this village with the river there all the time. And it was, I used to go there as a child and swim. And it was a very wonderful, idyllic, bucolic setting. And some years ago, I went back, and the river was really in, in bad shape. And, you know, I, I just had to go to Allegory for this. I'm thinking that maybe they, in Jamaica, we call the, the guardians of river spirits, we call them river mama. I think that, what do you call them in mommy water in, in, Af in parts of Africa? Or, or mermaids, nixies. So my, my take on the matter is that the river is polluted because the mermaid, the garden, has no interest in doing this kind of job again. She wants to maybe go, you know, join, she wants to go shopping in Miami or something or, anyway. <laughs> But um, the, 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 the burden of the, the, the poem is that I, I in my, this, the, the book is a series of elegies dedicated to my cousin Joan, who was born in this place. And in my mind, she, 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 she was dying. And I was thinking, if, if we could just get back to this river, maybe she could get some help from the River Mama. But once we got there, we found out that it wasn't like that anymore. River Mama. She sits with her back to us. Her teased hair is now bleached platinum. She has affixed piles of rhinestones and sequins over her shimmering, scaled skin. Here we have a perfect example of how to gild a lily. Please tell River Mama we're here, outside the doors of our underwater clinic. We say this to the nurse souls rolling bandages and grinding medicine blue stone in mortars. Though we see how our hairstyle has changed, it used to dip so regularly in waves. And we see her lips are stained parrotfish red, and her hubble skirt is bling bling iridescent. We still bring her the serious crab bite case, who is in need of our specialist treatment. Hair of dog, water cure for bite of crab, for maybe River Mumma medicine can cure her. We bring a wedge of brown soap for cleansing, a lost wedding ring found to make payment, details of one fraudulent agreement we seek to bleed indelible ink from. Mama, please come. All the while, the drowned souls drape bandages in long white strips across the clinic's entrance. Deaf to us, the drowned ones pound blue stones in mortar pestles, and we are not acknowledged because the river mama wants out. You can't hear. Everything here is changing. The bulrushes on the river banks now want to be palms in the king's garden. What king? The river is ostriching into the sand. Is that not obvious, the nurse souls ask? You can't take a hint. You can't read a sign. Mama no longer wants to be guardian of our waters. She wants to be big mama, dance hall queen of the greater Caribbean. She no longer wants to dispense clean water to baptize and cleanse, at least not gratis. She does not give a damn about polluted Kingston Harbor. She must expose her fish torso, rock the dance fans, go on tours overseas, go clubbing with P. Daddy, experience snow, shop in those underground multiplex malls spending our strong dollars. Go away. She will not be seeing you, for you have no insurance.
Thank you very much. Lorna, thank you very much. It, I definitely felt it was almost a, a bit of a spiritual experience listening to you. I feel um, I could draw strength from the words that you said, and actually we could all face most of the challenges that life throws us after that. So let's put you in charge.